going to say very much because we're, w the idea is to get you to share with us your memories and appreciations of the work that's to be done. Uh, and first of all, I'm going to invite Brian Wynne, uh, who's going to, who probably needs to be mic'd up. Um, uh, Brian Wynne, we, we, we felt that it was quite difficult for, uh, for Barry and David to, to give kind of uh, an account of SSU's contribution to the field because they're kind of really... They're not, they're not trumpet-blowing. They're kind of really humble and wonderful colleagues, generous colleagues. So we need an outsider to give that appraisal. And, and, and uh, Brian was roped in, and we're delighted that he, as one of the founder uh, members of the Science Society, one of the earliest students, uh, yeah. has agreed to give this appraisal. If you can... First thing I've got to say is it's both an honour and a big scare to have to do uh, this job. Um, but it's also um, uh, an occasion for me to be able to actually express the first time I think I've done this and had the opportunity to do it, to express my huge uh, appreciation um, having come here in October 71 so five years after, not a founding member, but I guess an early one, uh, John Law said he was the only research student when he came, I think, a year earlier. Um, but there were a few others. In fact, one of them I married, um, Cathy Stack, um, who moved on. Um, but uh, many other peers and shop floor, as it were, um, uh, labourers um, studying at the feet of Professors Barnes and Bloor. Where's David? I can't catch his eye now. But anyway, Bloor, yeah. Um, and Gary Worski is the historian of science amongst that trio of lecturers. And of course, um, mentor and friend and director of the unit, David Edge. Um, uh, David, basically, as director, created the space for these intellectual um, dynamos uh, to work, and he defended that space as well. Um, it wasn't just a natural space that was going to exist there. He had to defend it, and he did that in a way which protected all of us, I think it's fair to say, to get on with some work in relative peace. So that was a crucial role, and I want to pay tribute personally to David in particular, and I'm really pleased and grateful that Barbara is here to, um, to take part in these uh, celebratory discussions and events as well. So thanks very much, Barbara, for coming along too. Um, now, I arrived as a, a recently doctored natural scientist uh, from Cambridge in October of 71. Um, but I'd been to visit, of course, beforehand in about, can't remember, but January, February maybe of, of that year and met David on the recommendation of a friend and colleague at, at Cambridge. And uh, he basically suggested that I apply for a social science research council, as then was, uh, postdoctoral conversion fellowship. I'd never heard of this. I didn't really know what conversion was about. <laughs> I'd basically been moving away from the offer of a postdoc in the material science department, the department of my undergraduate and PhD degrees at Cambridge, basically because I realised in the emergence of the Oil, first oil crisis, oil crisis Mark I, don't know how many there have been since, but anyway, that was Mark I, the revolution in Persia as was, and um, the formation of OPEC, uh, the proposal to build God knows how many, I think it was 30-some nuclear reactors in the space of a very short period of time anyway, at the time when I was considering this. And I had basically found that... Um, the uh, 
the postdoc that I was offered at Cambridge, when my supervisor said to me, my PhD supervisor said to me, just write down a few suggestions about what you'd like to do. So with all of this going on, but as a real political innocent, um, I, I actually was thinking, well, I ought to be able to use material science to develop some useful things in relation to oil crisis and energy and so on. So I wrote down a few half-baked thoughts of that kind and my supervisor treated me like I'd come from planet Mars. He just did not understand why any of that would be interesting. And that night, very here and now in 2016. So um, the establishment of the unit and of similar kinds of units, each one with quite distinct characteristics and priorities and personalities, of course, um, in other higher education um, institutions in the UK, in the Netherlands, in the US, um, and elsewhere. Um, the, there were a variety of different programs imbued with different degrees of political um, articulation of critique and a political agenda as well as an intellectual agenda. Um, and what was interesting for me about the unit was that the strong program in the sociology of scientific knowledge was very, very precisely focused. Um, and it was focused on scientific knowledge. And I remember feeling as I spent three years here and then moved to Lancaster, but remained in quite regular contact. In fact, I stayed teaching the new course, the D course, in addition to sociology, philosophy, history of science courses, which I'd struggled with as a scientist and uh, gradually got on top of from Barry David and uh, Steve Shapin. Um, uh, the D course was a course on contemporary issues in science and technology that interested David and also he involved Harry Dickinson who's already been mentioned from engineering in alternative technology and uh, intermediate technology, those kinds of questions. So um, the, the striking thing for me was the way in which the, the intellectual agenda at the unit actually distance itself from all that was going on in pretty well all of the other uh, higher education departments and programs and so on, where science studies was also being born, developed and uh, promoted and actually followed by students in quite significant numbers at that time, all with their own different models of how to do it. So here, as uh, most of you will know, it was a science faculty unit and um, it basically was here to actually teach scientific undergraduates about the social dimensions of science. Um, and I, I don't, don't know quite when that institutional shift occurred. Uh, I lost track of that. But anyway, that's an important point, I think, about the unit's focus in those days. Uh, and the way in which the agenda um, developed. But, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm doing something I don't normally do here, which is I wrote some text, and it's fatal, because with text you get lost unless you just read it, which I'm never going to do. And I normally just put a PowerPoint up with headings, which act as my speaking notes. Um, so... Um, I'm going to get lost in here, and you'll have to excuse me for that. And I also need to check the time. Um, so um, one of the things that was extant at that time was, um, of course, the, the, the established, coming from the Soviet Union, um, originally in the 1930s, and work of people like Boris Hessen on quantum theory and the analysis of quantum theory as a bourgeois Western capitalist form of scientific knowledge, 
reflecting, for example, atomism and individualism, competitive individualism, as a cultural uh, set of values in the scientific knowledge being formed. And that remained a significant um, current in history of science and sociology of science, and I contributed to that myself um, for quite a long time, um, till those kind of distinctions uh, eroded and new questions were uh, on the agenda from maybe the 1980s onwards. But um, it's interesting that uh, quite a few of the radical science movement of the early 70s were actually producing analytical critiques. For example, I remember one, I can't remember the author's name, um, in an edited book of this kind on radical science, uh, showing how, in the analysis, in the analyst's view, um, chemical equations and formulae could actually be analysed in terms of their reflection of industrial chemistry and its productive values. Um, and from then to capitalist form modes of production and so on. So you see the Marxist-inspired uh, ethos of this kind of work, externalist sociology of scientific knowledge. All of that was being published, was around, was debated, and you know, was currency within the kind of seminars and um, I can't remember the courses, the reading lists, but it was, it was abroad, as it were, and in the atmosphere at that time, and students were being exposed to it. Uh, in classrooms and outside classrooms too. Um, so, so those kind of political concerns were kind of kept at bay within the unit and the strong programs, key focus for me when I encountered it was basically the symmetry principle. You know, that actually it's not only error or you know, wrong scientific knowledge or you know, ineffective technologies or technologies that don't, it's not only error which needs sociological explanation, but that true knowledge can also be explained sociologically. And that was basically, I think, the, the point that was so severely, in fact, was so severely, is still so severely misunderstood about the strong program and indeed science studies more broadly. The idea that if you say true scientific knowledge also needs sociological explanation and can be given sociological explanation, that that means that you're actually denying the validity, truth value of that knowledge. And I remember in those emergent days, the main kind of controversies were with philosophers who wanted to actually banish this way of thinking about scientific knowledge from the agenda and to therefore banish the emergent Edinburgh School and Barnes and Bloor in particular. Um, I remember your returns from seminars in LSC and other places where rationality was the focus and this kind of conflict was coming all the time. And latterly myself, I've encountered the same kind of dismissal um, from a false starting point, basically, in addressing the sociology of scientific knowledge. Um, the, the way in which um, I saw this developing in particular was, um, for, for my own, in my own experience, was basically um, in a, attempting to something which I've only really seen and articulated in this way relatively recently. Uh, when I left Edinburgh very soon after that, um, the controversy over the uh, oxide fuel reprocessing plant at the nuclear complex at Sellafield, or the wind scale plant, um, uh, came really began in 1975. I left in Edinburgh in 74. And I was immediately drawn into, for a variety of reasons, I was drawn into that controversy over the Thorpe plant and its environmental and health risks 
and also in its economic viability too. Uh, a lot of questions about it. Um, but the, the interesting thing from the point of view of the strong program and the Edinburgh perspective and its body of work and its development for me was that basically the main focus, one of the things which I think allowed it to be so sharp and distinctive in any of the work that was going on in sociology of scientific knowledge, apart from probably Harry Collins's uh, program of EPO, empirical program of relativism at Bath, um, was the very sharp focus on what I call private scientific knowledge, esoteric laboratory type scientific knowledge, where awareness concerns about public authority, public response or whatever, are not really relevant concerns at that point in the life of that, those kind of bodies of scientific knowledge. I was getting involved in the wind scale inquiry and reading scientific papers, claims about radiobiological risk and about the environmental pathways and processes of the different isotopes emitted from that plant and wanted to try doing a sociology of scientific knowledge, a strong program on that kind of public science, which is being articulated not only for public regulation and justification of the authorization of this plan, but also for public authority. You know that we, the authorities, have got the legitimate expertise and you can trust it. You publics out there can trust it. You don't need to dispute it. And anybody disputing it, therefore, you can just ignore them. So that was the message. And when we fast forward, if you like, to 2016 and we think about oh, there have been a few more cases of that kind since then, we can see the kind of richness, if you like, of the turf on which the strong programme was landing in attempting to make sense of and deal with those kind of controversies. Um, so the, 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 the shift that I tried to make from uh, private scientific knowledge... Private isn't quite the right word, but it's, you get what I mean, I hope. Esoteric scientific knowledge in private spaces like laboratories. Um, the shift shocked and disappointed. I actually met with a friend who was in the physics department, Pete Chapman. As well, some of you may remember Pete Chapman, uh, Fuel's Paradise, Penguin book in the early, mid-70s. He was doing his PhD in the Cavendish lab at Cambridge, and he said to me, Brian, where do you think most of the money in your department for research, where do you think it comes from? So I just innocently said, I was a northern, northern country grammar school boy and just done my thing at Cambridge because I was good at maths at school, so it was do science. And so I did science. I was taking the path of least resistance. And um, then, OK, you're very good at science, so apply for Cambridge. And so it went on right through the materials science department. It happened to be a good department. It was socially great and easy. So I thought, why not continue? But when I realised, and Pete started to probe me, that actually I realised that, that most of the money in the department for research was coming from not the Science Research Council as was, which I was thinking of when I said government, but Ministry of Defence and Ministry of Trade and Industry, etc. Big industrial stuff for smelting aluminium, etc. Making aluminium alloys for aircraft and aerospace and missiles and goodness knows what. I thought, mm, maybe I need to have a rethink here. Or maybe f actually not a rethink so much as a think. Um, so... Um, because that path of least resistance stuff wasn't necessarily particularly thought intensive. Um, so uh, Pete said, go up and see David Edge in Edinburgh. He's just directing a new unit there. And so I came to see David. And he, as an ex-radio astronomer at Cambridge himself, before he went to the BBC and then came as director here at the Science Studies Unit, uh, he understood exactly what my concerns were and in what ways I was lost, because I was lost. And so he said, 
these SSRC conversion research fellowships exist. Why not apply for one? We'll support you. So that's what I did and that's what I got. And the conversion part is interesting because, a bit of irony here, the SSRC was trying to actually improve the quantitative skills of the social sciences in the UK at that time. So it had established, I think it was 12 a year, postdoc conversion fellowships for natural scientists like me who were competent in mathematics and computing and quantification generally to come to a social science place and actually inform the social sciences about quantitative skills. The irony is that actually having come from that hard science place with those capacities, with the research experience as well of at least three years of a PhD, I actually went in exactly the opposite direction, probably went more interpretive than social science really wanted or imagined. So um, that was a kind of shift of a huge kind. And um, as Thomas Kuhn used to say, paradigm shift within the sciences is equivalent to a religious conversion. Um, mine was even bigger, moving from natural science, you know, kind of high status, intense place for natural science to the science studies unit. And that's when I had to start coping with Kuhn, Popper, Feyerabend, and all the rest of it, and Barnes and Bloor and Worski, as then was Gary Worski, soon to be replaced by Steve Shapin. So that's the kind of context in which I encountered the strong program in the sociology of scientific knowledge and a variety of its ancillary spin-offs and other work that was going on at the unit as well. I remember, for example, Jonathan Howard, historian of genetics, early 20th century genetics at that time, uh, who was, a, I think he was a postdoc fellow as well, and uh, now, or until recently retired at Manchester. Um, so, in addition to those people, of course, there are quite a few others beside me who would have qualified to do this job. And I'm looking at John Law somewhere up there and Wendy Faulkner, who's here, Donald. Um, and uh, I think um, Anne Kerr might be here. There's also Dr. Professor Pickering down here. Um, and I, I was still, a, yeah, okay, I got the, uh, I got the, um, the short straw or the long straw, I'm not quite sure which one. But anyway, I'm very pleased to be attempting to do this. And what am I attempting to do as I read my terms from Robin in the invitation? It was to provide a review of the context of the strong program, the Science Studies Unit's work at the time it was established and really burning, developing um, its substantial and lasting work in the 60s, 70s. Let's remember that context and then try to put together the role and the significance of that work in the strong program, the Sociology of Scientific Knowledge by Barnes, Bloor, Worski, and then Shapin, and Donald, and John, and various others who followed on from their lead. Um, so the, there's no way, of course, in which I can review that in any kind of comprehensive or definitive way. So this is decidedly a partial and Apache review, and I'm very... Uh, it's essential that David and Barry, Donald, and I hope others will actually interject later and actually fill out a bit more. But I don't want to just give reminiscences. Uh, I want to try to make sense from my own point of view uh, of what was going on and what it was doing in the larger world of not only the intellectual world, but the political world too. So... Um, it's worth remembering, for example, that at that time, um, 
we had uh, a pretty vigorous political ferment critique of science for its role in the military industrial complex. The Vietnam War and the protests around it were still very much alive at that time. And uh, I think it was a report I recall at SPRU, the Science Policy Research Unit <coughs> at Sussex, led then by Chris Freeman, uh, which had analysed the components of the UK public R&D budget in around about 1970, showed that just over 50% of the R&D budget, taxpayers' money, was basically devoted to military research and development. That was a kind of key point for kicking off a debate about priorities in scientific research and development and in the innovation processes that flow from there. Um, but that wasn't the, the essential character of the unit's intellectual program at all. And that's what's striking really about this. So the political protest and critique of science and technology that was developing vigorously, as I say, uh, at that time, connected partly with CND and all of those uh, demonstrations and so on, and the intellectual cases being made against those kinds of technological priorities as well. Um, that, that kind of political movement had a few radical scientists in themselves who were leaders within it, and also scholars who were interested in actually doing sociological and political analysis of why science and technology were actually oriented and embedded within trajectories of those kinds. So that was a, a, an interesting political and intellectual program that was developing in higher education in Britain, and indeed in other countries too, um, certainly stimulated by those political protests. And also alongside of those, of course, there was the rise of the environmental movement as well in a similar kind of period, and the institutionalization of that um, in the form of legislation, regulatory bodies, the establishment of devoted natural environment research councils, as the UK version of this was called, 1971, I think. Um, interestingly, though, and significantly, led by physicists, not by environmental scientists and ecologists. And in fact, at that same time, John Maddox, the editor of Nature, was writing a book called The Doomsday Syndrome, which was directed at the Club of Rome in particular and their Limits to Growth study of the same kind of years. Uh, I think Maddox's book was 1972. Um, the Ecologist magazine, Blueprint for Survival, which I remember going to somewhere, Perth or somewhere, with David, David Edge to listen to Edward Goldsmith, the editor of The Ecologist, read God knows how many pages of the Blueprint for Survival to a conference audience. Um, so Maddox was basically saying, in response to all of this, ecology is anti-science. It's only 1971, in the same period that we were, I was arriving in Edinburgh, Barry and David and um, Gary and Steve were developing the strong program in the sociology of scientific knowledge. And the questions that I was interested in were basically about, well, what is science? What kind of um, flexibility has it got to maybe be moved in different directions from those which seem to predominate and shape the world as we faced it at that time? And those are still questions that are relevant to us that I tried to make towards scientific knowledge in public arenas like the Windscale Public Inquiry and the expert controversies and conflicts which were occurring there and their modes of closure, um, which was, you know, of particular interest. Um, that, that was actually encouraged by um, 
STS scholars in other places, particularly, for example, Dorothy Nelkin, um, the scholar at uh, political scientist, really, of, of science and technology at Cornell University and latterly then New York University. Um, but Dorothy encouraged me very much to do this kind of case study, but she wasn't interested at all in the kind of work which was going on in Edinburgh from Barry and David and Donald and others um, because she was actually locked within a kind of American, North American style, rational choice, political science, interest-based um, explanation of the different sides in those kinds of scientific and technical controversies. And interest for Dorothy meant social and economic interests. And a strong program developed, I think informed by Kuhn in particular, the extra notion that actually interest can also be meaningfully um, applied to the commitments which scientists make in private science, not just in public arenas like public controversies, but in private science you can actually legitimately talk about interests as explanatory factors in the ways in which, you know, as Kuhn called it, the functional role of dogma within science, that actually technical and cognitive commitments within a paradigm and its practical culture and its modes of self-reproduction are actually interest too and can be used in that way in sociological explanation of scientific knowledge. So there's a, quite an interesting confusion of the term interest during that period. This is early 80s. I think uh, my book was first published on the Windscale Inquiry in 82. And um, that kind of debate was also kicking off, of course, in other directions with um, uh, Latour and Woolgar and their reflexive critique of the notion of interest in the strong program. Um, the idea that, well, actually, as you know, it'll be familiar anyway to anybody who's read any of actor network theory, um, the, uh, and that critique, which was published in Social Studies of Science and was very widely read and used in teaching and so on, that basically you can't use interests as an explanandum when it's part of what needs explaining. Uh, there's a kind of circularity, if you like, in the Edinburgh program's use of interests. Um, and working a bit more in those broader and messier fields of science in public arenas, uh, I could actually see what um, Woolgar and Latour were on about with that critique. But I think it's fair to say that from the Edinburgh angle, it remained perfectly legitimate to remain to, with that definition of interests, which... Barry and David, I think it's fair to say, were actually defining and using in that strong program way. Um, I, I think that the, the symmetry notion gets a lot more complex when you try to employ it in scientific knowledge in public arenas of the kind I've just outlined and many, many more, of course, as well, several of which people in this audience have themselves conducted. Um, but the, the principle remains, I think, that basically the reflexivity principle can only be pursued if one actually pursues the symmetry principle too in public domains as well as in private scientific domains. And that's really where I've I guess I've continued to push that, including in all of the domains of public understanding of science or critiques of the deficit model of public understanding of science that I've done uh, in later years, where basically I've always been trying to say, don't just focus on the public as your analytical and maybe your political problem, but actually remember the public is responding to something. And it's worth trying to work out what it is that they're responding to. 
and what they're responding to, the established powerful discourses, often of science, being used to actually justify political and normative commitments in science's name. So there's a kind of opening up process which is at least potential there, whether it always succeeds with our kind of scholarship is another matter, but it's actually crucial for a democratic society living in comfort, but inevitably also in tension with science. And I think we're such a long way from getting to that point as yet. And I'd like to continue to pose the question, what role can STS play and sociology of scientific knowledge in particular in these kinds of domain? Um, the focus may have shifted more towards much more ill-defined and diffuse forms of technoscience. Um, in pretty well every domain you care to think of in daily life. Um, and of course, the processes of the boundaries of definition between techno-scientific and other user communities, for example, as mentioned earlier, but many other kinds of publics of that research science are much more complicated and difficult to define in these days. The mode two science is one kind of example of that, but there are many others too. Um, uh, and so uh, I think that the, the very object science or scientific knowledge is itself much more ambiguous nowadays than it was in the days when I arrived at the unit and the strong program was uh, under development and under attack as well, of course. But um, it, it remains a question that needs to be asked about why it is that naturalization of normative commitments still proceeds as almost a presumptive. I, I tend not to think of it as a conspiratorial, deceptive process, but much more as a natural, cultural, and so on effect of the institutional cultures which we have and actually where there are political economic forces at work in the backgrounds of those which are reinforcing that tendencies. And I might just finish here with one example which was relevant in the 1970s and I think it still remains relevant today. Just a case from the 1990s. Um, the Brent Spa um, decommissioned oil platform, the controversy over the Greenpeace um, occupation of the Brent Spa as it was being towed from the North Sea where it, its use had been discontinued for dumping in the North Atlantic, just dumping on the ocean floor in the North Atlantic. 1994, I think, that occupation took place. And I remember talking with Chris Rose, the campaigns manager of Greenpeace at that time, uh, about it and, you know, how they'd strategized, how they'd done it, how they'd planned it and so on, and what their um, responses were to the various attacks that uh, they got. Um, Luckily, not military attacks, but uh, plenty of attacks uh, in the media and in Parliament and all over the place for their irrational anti-scientific manoeuvres. Um, basically, as with the Windscale Inquiry, whose environmental case I basically made up as the inquiry went on, when I realised just how weak and contradictory and ineffective the environmental case that I was supposed to be taking on and putting to the inquiry judge and tribunal, just how weak it was. I could not stand up with a straight face and actually defend that case against the nuclear industry and all of its expensive lawyers and experts. So I had to make up a different case, and it was basically a relational case. And it was essentially based upon the notion again, a science studies unit idea, the finitism of scientific knowledge. There is never enough knowledge. 
for the kinds of issues that we stir up and then pose without even realising we're posing them as questions about the environmental or the health impacts or the other kinds of impacts or risks of this or that economic or technological intervention in the world. There is never enough knowledge. In that sense, there are always deficits of knowledge, including public deficits of knowledge. That is not the point about the deficit model critique. The, the critique of that deficit model was actually about the use of public deficits of knowledge as a rationalisation for public refusal to accept the normative commitments which scientists were making on behalf of governments dressed up as scientific revelations. So, um, in the Brent Spar example, as with the Windscale example, we were basically saying this problem, this question should be framed differently. So, the industry and indeed the judge were insistently saying the Windscale inquiry question about the environmental risks is only about the thought plant, nothing else. That's the object, the thought plant at least the plans for the thought plant. The thought plant didn't exist at that point, but plans did. And projections did and promises did about environmental discharges, controls, etc., etc., doses to populations in the vicinity and so on. So um, we were basically saying, well, actually, the thought plant is already being superseded by at least one more plant in the industry's own planning. And it's also be, being justified by reference to the plutonium it will produce for the fast breeder reactor, then a pilot reactor, test reactor up at Doon Ray in the north of Scotland. So we're saying, how can you rationally analyse, okay, how can you rationally analyse the risks from this technology as only the thought plant when it's part of a trajectory? What's the rational question to ask here? Isn't it the trajectory? And as soon as you do that, of course, you're basically accepting that precision in terms of risk assessments go out the window. But you've got that conflict between precision and meaning. Isn't it more meaningful to ask the question about the trajectory? And then the question arises, isn't it? So what counts as good or sound, as the usual term is, sound scientific knowledge. Is it only precision? Is it always precision? Is it invariably, unconditionally precision? Or might it be other questions which arise if you say, well, actually, we're committed to sustainability and environmental sustainability as well as other forms of sustainability. We might even be committed to justice too, and that might also change your scientific questions. So the framing question was central, and that was true also the Brent Spa. So Greenpeace were accused of being completely irrational and occupying and stopping the Brent Spa from being dumped on the Atlantic Ocean floor because you wouldn't even be able to do an environmental risk assessment of the Brent Spa because it was so trivial in terms of its effects on the environment of the Atlantic Ocean floor. But if you then ask, yeah, but hang on a minute, there are 400 and some other oil and gas rigs in the North Sea not yet decommissioned, where are they going to go if you put the first one on the Atlantic Ocean floor? And there was also actually a big consignment of nuclear weapons waste actually sat in docksides in Fleetwood, uh, somewhere, might have been Glasgow, which were also designated for Atlantic Ocean floor dumping. And they were only not dumped because Greenpeace had lobbied the, the dockers' unions to actually make the case against them dumping it there. So you can see a trajectory was being mapped out and being begun by that one oil rig, the Brent Spa. And Greenpeace's case was, well, it's a trajectory, stupid. It's not just one rig. Where is, what's the right framing of the risk assessment? It's a political issue. So it's a democratic issue, we'd like to think. It's not only a scientific issue. Of course, science needs to inform the issue. So we have that question, which is about what is science here? What do we mean by science? 
and particularly when we go into public domains, what do we mean by science as public authority? And this remains a big part of the agenda for SSK and science studies, including, including the stuff which David and Barry patiently began a long time ago now, but thank God they actually began it at least, which was explaining the mistake of assuming that the symmetry principle means we can just believe whatever we like. That's never been part of the strong program, never been part of the science studies unit, and never been part of any of the work that most of us alumni of that fantastic experience of having been here has actually led to. But it remains, it remains one of the familiar and common accusations against that work. I'd like to make that history. That would really be a dream come true. And so please let's continue to work at that. And again, um, my dearest thanks to David, Barry, absent friends in the form of Gary and Steve, and Barbara and David in particular, for their leadership and support in the unit of those days. And um, I thank you for your patience in at least trying to kick off this discussion. <clears throat>